We are now recording. Welcome to the February 3rd edition of the Business of Agriculture Success Group. Obviously, we uh, love you all. Thanks for being here. Uh, our newest guest today is Megan. She's the gal that some of you already met. Jim, the girl that uh, doesn't look familiar is Megan. She's in the hops industry, and she's uh, up the road from you in Michigan. She works for the New Zealand Hops Company, which is not New Zealand at all. She's in Michigan. I don't understand, but maybe she'll tell us about it someday. Today, we're going to talk about um, the industry known as activism. I'm going to present some of the industry stuff. Um, we're going to talk about cause groups within and conflict groups that will impact what we do in agriculture. And then Todd is going to discuss when these groups and their causes are um, juxtaposed and actually in conflict with one another. And then, so when the conflict industry is conflicting with itself, and then Michelle's going to talk about the, the struggle with the entire uh, movement is how complex they are and um, that there's no right answer and uh, there's uh, no easy fix. So that's what we're doing. We're going to hear from Carlena about her shrimp enterprise in Fowler, Indiana, and then uh, Jim Fargo Market Saver Report, and then Lightning Round. All right, so let's lead off. We promised you we we're going to talk about the activism uh, business. One year ago, I was on stage for the Indiana Hardwood Lumberman's Association, and they really liked my ag stuff. And they said, remember, forestry and timber is ag. So we think that a lot of stuff that you do outlook about where ag is, uh, exports, environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera, are very much what we want our members to hear. So I did an ag program for them, but I also recorded a podcast with them. If you get bored, you can go back and listen to it from a year ago. But what's interesting is they talked at great length about the conflict industry. And it's the first time ever that I had heard activism. You know, we know about PETA or Humane Society of the United States or Environmental Working Group or Sierra Club or Audubon Society. We don't think of them as industry, but after my discussion dialogue with the Hardwood Lumberman Association, obviously they call it the conflict industry, meaning those groups that actually might be nonprofits on paper are very profitable and uh, entities, at least in terms of they pay a lot of their staff very, very well, and they are hugely bankrolled organizations and their business and their business model is to go out and harpoon us um, and uh, through the media, through their brilliant PR campaigns, through their protests, through their usage of their members or their supporters, and then how it becomes an industry. So in talking with the Indiana Harvard Lumber Association, I then started talking more about it myself, how it was indeed an industry. And I talked about it in my book, Food Fear, uh, how the causes are indeed, and yes, this does say desk copy, if you're wondering, yes, I wrote on my book, it's the, it's the desk copy, so I can reference it. Uh, in Food Fear, I talked about this a lot, because the reality is we're going to have food fights that continue for the rest of our lives in this industry, not just because there's somebody that says, oh gosh, they're using hormones in my chicken, it's really because the fight is kept alive by the cause. You know, people think that I'm being mean when I say this, but it's a very... Um, pertinent uh, to this discussion uh, statement. The worst thing that could ever happen to the American Cancer Society is that we cure cancer. Uh, not being mean, my brother died of pancreatic cancer, I, I get it, but the reality is the cause needs the cause. And if you've got a thousand employees that are employed by the American Cancer Society, Humane Society of the United States, name any cause, the worst thing that could ever happen for them is the cause goes away, the cause is cured. Uh, the, 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 the problem is rectified, if you will. So the Humane Society of the United States, Environmental Working Group, are indeed businesses. And what we do wrong in agriculture is we fight them ourselves, and we do the same thing. We always bring in data, science, facts. And those organizations brilliantly never dabble in any of those things. They dabble in pure, hard, human emotion. I just I just muted you, Andy, because I'm sure you're in your tractor, and I know you joined in, but we could hear your we could hear your noise. And by the way, Mr. Ambriel, I'm wearing a tie. This is a sugar beet tie because I've been uh, employed by the sugar beet growers, and I wanted you to see that I'm taking this very seriously as a professional in my sugar beet tie. Okay, that's so really impressive. Thank you. All right, so these organizations use us essentially as their means of fundraising okay and i can go into that here a, a great deal more because i'm going to talk about PETA as an example and i'm going to talk about proposition 12. michelle you have your hand up my dear 
I do. I wanted to add one um, that Greenpeace often falls in that category and they started as anti-whaling and now there is a very little whaling around the world. And so you've seen them transition their message in the last probably 20 or so years uh, because they need a new cause to keep going. And a lot of the topics that they are opposed to now are agriculture related. So um, I thought it was a good example. That's an ex excellent example. Thank you. By the way, remember, we're all friends here. We, we are conversant. So if you want to chime in at all, um, I can go on a lot about this. And it's not, we're not doing that preach the choir, you know, ag does that a lot. Go, go, you know, if you want to get hired as a, a $1,000 cheap um, uh, ag speaker, court farmer audiences and then stand up there and tell them they're the salt of the earth that they work harder than everybody else and uh you know and then close with a prayer and a poem you can get a thousand dollars for every goddamn cooperative meeting and farmer uh, breakfast in in the world but anyway i'm not gonna preach to the choir but but careful on that you. because i did tell the uh at a co-op outlook meeting one time i said that the last people that the uh, Iowa Corn Growers Association needs to be marketing to is the Iowa Corn Grower and uh, a member of the Iowa Corn Growers Association walked out of the presentation. So that will really piss them off if you tell them that they shouldn't stop, that they should be spending their money in places like Africa as opposed to in Iowa sponsoring Iowa State football. And I, I successfully pissed everybody off in that room all at once. If you and then I gave a bear's corn outlook and haven't been invited back. Exactly. You know what? People don't like hearing what they don't like to hear. Uh, and Jim Smith is plotting. That's why he's, that's why he's always been a fan of Damian Mason. I tell these people uh, what they don't want to hear. And then not only I, instead of telling the farmers how hard they work in the salt of the earth, I say, you people actually, when they get auto steer for your F two fifties, you won't even have to turn the wheel when you drive to the farm service agency office to collect your welfare check. Oh God, that gets them going. Anyway, so here's my uh, welcome, Tuggy Hubner. See, he Hubner tuned in just in time for me to bash on farmers. Back to the conflict industry. So let's talk about, as Michelle said, what you'll see because if you again, the worst thing that could ever happen to the cause of the conflict industry group, you know, whether it's Greenpeace or Environmental Working Group, is that the cause goes away. A, a, a disparate example that's not about agriculture, but it's very similar. There was just a, 10 to 20 years ago, an incredible movement against coal. So the environmental groups knew, let's beat the shit out of coal. Barack Obama took office in 2008, and he promised, he, he promised, and the media obviously buried this because they were very supportive of him. They said, he said in an interview that if you were in the coal industry prepared to go bankrupt, we've never had a president that took office siding with the conflict industry, but the environmental groups obviously supported that. He pledged that he would bankrupt coal, and frankly, it's happened, but it wasn't really Barack Obama. It was a shift away from coal. So all the uh, groups that were making money by beating the shit out of coal as their whipping boy actually had to change their target because their fundraising used to be, look at these dirty skies, look at acid rain, if you're old enough to remember acid rain. That's because of coal. Donate money to the Sierra Club, Audubon Society, uh, you know, any, any environmental group, and we're going to work against coal. Coal went away because of the economics. Natural gas was a better, cheaper source, and also you didn't, you know, get all the pollution issues. So electricity generation switched to natural gas, not because of the protest, but because of the actual economics. So what are those groups going to do? They moved to protesting pipelines. Fast forward to 12 years, and what was the first thing that happened on the first day of the new administration? We nixed the pipeline. So the cause needs to always have a cause because that's their profitability. So let's talk about the conflict industry using PETA as an example. PETA was founded by some animal rights activist named Ingrid Newkirk. She's British um, in like uh, the 70s. Actually, I think it was 1980. So it's been around about 40 years. <clears throat> They're well-funded. They're globally one of the best-known conflict industry uh, names. Everybody knows PETA. They, uh, you can go on Activist Facts, which is a pretty good uh, uh, source. If you want to see, they dig up dirt on the activists. PETA is revenue, uh, about $50 million. Uh, has been as high as $62 million, depending on how their fundraising goes. And PETA, obviously, and the model is always pretty much the same. 
get your supporters and your members and your donors to really be your soldiers, to be, as Stalin called them, your useful idiots. So the people that are in the Washington, D.C. office or the London office or the San Francisco office of the Environmental Working Group or PETA or Humane Society, they're essentially just looking at how can we make money through public relations, PR and hit campaigns. And then we bring in huge amounts of donations. Those people that are out there carrying the signs don't make any money. The people in the offices make the money, lawyers, PR people, and administrative, right? So they use the useful idiots, as Stalin called them, to go out and hold the signs and create huge, massive public displays that the media loves to pick up. So then you've got the media doing a lot of work on your behalf, and then you're essentially paying for some media and paying for staff. That's really the business model. Environmental Working Group is newer to it, uh, founded by an activist, uh, attorney in San Francisco, Environmental Working Group, then decided Monsanto was their whale, right? Greenpeace had whaling. What did Environmental Working Group do? Went after Monsanto and used that as their whale. Uh, for years, then the marches against Monsanto, a lot of that was perpetuated by Environmental Working Group. When you heard studies that there's, uh, you know, glyphosate is in your child's cereal, uh, it's poison, they're going to kill your kid through his lucky charms. That was really Environmental Working Group through their own studies, which are not peer reviewed or verified through any universities. That's the model, right? Release studies, use hit pieces, let the media do your work and let your useful idiots go out and carry the signs once you get them all agitated and stirred up. Now, let's talk about where this goes for us. We got people in the hog industry here. Uh, I just spoke to the Iowa Pork Congress last week virtually. And um, I was asked about Proposition 12. Maybe you don't know about Proposition 12, but it is a big thing that, Todd, do you want to tell them about Proposition 12? I'll go ahead. Okay, Proposition 12 was on the ballot in California on this last election cycle. Every election cycle or two, you'll notice that there is something in California that pertains to agriculture, generally animal agriculture, and it is pushed by the PETAs and the HSUSs. And you're saying, okay, what, what was the legislation? It was about whether you could keep a sow in a uh, gestation pen for a certain amount of time. So it was all about pen size and uh, amount of time that a hog could be in a certain pen, okay? So what they do is they run media ads showing a mistreated hog in a small pen. Uh, usually they like to show the ones where the hog is chewing on the bars and they say, these hogs are going crazy. They're, they're losing their mind. They're insane because they're confined in these terrible barns. Vote yes on Proposition 12 and we'll end this. And you're saying, are there even hog facilities in California? They grow almonds and lettuce and chickens. Do they even? No, the hogs are in Iowa and Minnesota and North Carolina and Nebraska and Indiana and Illinois. But here's what they are very smart about doing. The conflict industry, meaning the animal activist groups, say, we're going to create the, the furor through publicity and media. And then we'll get the media to come out and cover some protests with our members or our useful idiots carrying signs. And we create this huge movement in California. But the legislation doesn't just say they're going to impact pen sizes and how hogs are raised in California, because there really aren't that many hogs in California, certainly not per capita. But they say any pork product that comes to the state of California has to adhere to California's production standards. So de facto, the, the cause group has now imposed uh, livestock practices on the rest of the country because Iowa would still like to sell hogs to California. So if you're a hog producer in Iowa, you're going to have to comply to what California's standards are for hog production, even though you don't live there. They did this on chickens. They began with Proposition 1 or uh, then with Proposition 8. There's been two chicken propositions, same thing. The first one went through, and the cause groups are brilliant. They very ambiguously, and Jim knows more about this because he's in California, they very ambiguously define what they want for the new standards. And so then the producers right here saying, well, crap, I don't know. They said we're supposed to put bigger pins in where the uh, the first wording was where the hens can live a natural um, existence. It's like, what the hell does that mean? So the producers are all forced to create bigger pens and put in scratching pads uh, and little roosting bars. And then 
Humane Society comes back and uses them as the whipping boy again, shows pickers of hens in small pens and, uh, and, and then says, you need to vote because we didn't go far enough the first time. And the point is there's no appeasing them because reality is they're just simply trying to raise more money and continue to move the field goal, uh, goalpost, if you will, down, down the uh, future. So this is what the activists do. Again, it is an industry. You, you know, too many of our customers think it's very innocuous that these groups are out there. They care about, you know, pig comfort. The reality is it's fundraising and we are the absolute lever that's being used to, to make the money. So Proposition 12 is a great example. Not only does it, <clears throat> there'll be a new law in four more years, they'll come back and say, Proposition 12 didn't go far enough. Turns out those pigs are still going insane. They're still in small pins. Let's do Proposition 11. And Proposition 11, four years from now, will again, de facto, make a regulation for all of the country because once they get it pushed through in California with 40 million residents, they know that many other states are going to have to adhere to California standards to have them as a marketplace. So that's the industry. I can go on about some other numbers for you, but I, uh, we can share it or we can go to Todd. Anybody? I guess I'm just wondering what role does like the the business sector play in this i mean i see what where do we find that they have a voice for their suppliers i mean you would think that publicly traded companies are responsible for sourcing material in a way that is the best for the organization for their shareholders and customers where do you see them playing a role to help protect their suppliers and prevent these changes that's ultimately just costing them and their consumer more money if it's not accurate it's a good example. So when I did the Iowa Pork Congress, I know we're talking a lot about animal agriculture, but you know, it's going to be a lot of things. Cause like I said, you're in the house business, the environmental working group decides, Oh, craft beer is very popular right now. Let's go after Sam Adams and some of the craft brewers and beat the hell out of them over the fact that they use fungicide and insecticides in all the hops fields on a very regular basis. You know, my understanding that they're spraying those fields, you know, like eight times a season. So, um, the problem is the corporation uh, always wants to look good on in, in media and also to their customer base. So it's easier for Walmart or Kroger or McDonald's or any other group to throw ag under the bus than it is to stand up to the consumer because then they'll also be standing out there alone because once uh, Walmart takes a stand, then trust me, Costco and Kroger are going to say, ha, those rotten bastards over at Walmart, see, they don't care if they're poisoning your kids. We wouldn't do that. So that's the tough part. Um, the, uh, the hogs industry, when I did this thing last week for Iowa pork, uh, <clears throat> it's my understanding that the Packers now, Rob Brenneman, who, who Todd knows, who's been a customer of mine, is a huge hog producer, 275 employees up in Iowa and also Missouri. Um, he said, well, these Packers didn't take Proposition 12 very seriously. And I even asked them as an industry person, what are you doing to fight Proposition 12? And the Packers sort of just laughed it off. Then it got passed. And then they started scrambling saying, it's going to take a year for us to get all of our suppliers retrofitted with bigger pins for these pigs and all this kind of thing. And so Brenneman told his, he's mostly with Tyson, said, Tyson, I, I, it's going to take me a year and I'll just do it with my new buildings. I'm not going to go back and retrofit all my old ones. And then he said, here's what my numbers are going to look like. They said, well, what if we had to pay you to do it? So the Packers are, instead of Megan fighting it, they didn't really fight it. They didn't really even think it was going to be serious. And they didn't, I think, I can't believe that they would be this short-sighted. They didn't view, as I keep saying, that California's regulatory um, uh, climate essentially be, makes it de facto a national or a federal regulatory environment because them being 40 million uh, consumers, everybody else wants to sell into that. So um, to answer your question, it looks like on at least the hog packing side, they didn't take it seriously or they thought it would be unpopular to fight it. And so they, pa they passed it and now they're scurrying. And in fact, told um, my hog guy that they would... Uh, financially incentivize him to make the changes to his production, uh, at least the new stuff coming on board. The other group I would say that is that, you know, is on the industry side of these conversations would be trade associations. Um, and so they're able to give a voice outside of an individual brand and they often represent multiple brands. Um, but coming from my perspective of these issues are normally really complicated. 
uh, a lot of the problems right now with trade associations is you can't get all of your members to agree. Uh, and so with GMO labeling a few years ago on Capitol Hill, uh, through those discussions, we actually saw the Grocer Manufacturers Association, which represents Unilever and Nestle and like every big consumer product good company implode because they couldn't get their members to come up with an alternative. So it's not necessarily just you need to have like it's not just necessarily standing up and saying this is a problem. It is getting a big enough voice um, or enough alignment on what a proposed alternative is. And so an industry has an alternative or they have an example that they would like either legislatively to follow or for the public to follow, then it, it causes, um, it gives us direction. But again, with the GMO labeling, we saw um, Cheerios go forward and, and their generic Cheerios, which is an oat product, say non-GMO. And so the group kind of craters. And so there is a place for an industry conversation uh, but you got you have to be on the same page or you have to be willing to stick together or you have to be at least willing to uh, follow through on the decision that's made and not go a different direction. Probably a good example of prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma. I want to hear from Jim since we've used California as, as an example and he's our Californian uh, about this. But before I do, I'm going to set him up. He is kind of a trade group guy. He's, he's not for the... California Ag Retailer Association, but he represents a lot of California ag retailers in a different capacity. And the thing is, uh, as Ryan pointed out, the Corn Growers Association would rather get together at meetings and be told how hard they all work and how they're the salt of the earth and, and, and all that versus being told, hey, your leadership here doesn't know how to fight this battle. Uh, you, you know, the Corn Growers Association got mad at Anheuser-Busch a couple of years ago over the uh, corn syrup commercial and all went online and dumped out their Bud Lights and put it on Twitter. And I'm like, you stupid hillbilly. Nobody should drink Bud Light anyhow. So anyway, uh, the thing is, they've never gone after the cause groups that are trying to bankrupt them. Instead, they're going after Anheuser-Busch. Like, you know which one you could win? You could win the environmental working group uh, if you just point, expose them for what they are, a vast fundraising organization. That's, a, that's scaring you as opposed to fighting Anheuser-Busch over one of their ad campaigns. So a lot of times these groups, I'm, I'm working for one, the Georgia milk people, they are so political, they'd rather work against me and my ad campaign than against what their real threats are, which are the animal rights groups that use them as their, again, as their fundraising lever. So Jim, do you get a lot of representation from the trade groups that your people are part of when it comes to fighting against uh, activism, or does it usually come back on you? No, our trade groups are, are hugely active in that, especially in California and the West Coast, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. We have, we have associations that are fighting that full time. On a national level, we have the Agricultural Retailers Association out of Washington, D.C. They go to work every single day to represent these kind of issues on behalf of the retail producers in the United States. Here in California, they're attacking so many different angles. It can be water, air quality, it can be animal rights. Um, and, and something I was gonna mention later in, in the call, California has got a super majority in our Senate right now. So, so all of these activists are really budding up to our legislature and you can get almost anything through right now. There's, there's nothing that can block um, the legislation in California right now with a supermajority of the Democrats. That's frightening to me. <clears throat> There's something else that's frightening I want to add because I know we have a Montana girl on here, my, my girl, Allie. You know, the only thing that's more frightening than that is that you goddamn Californians won't stay there. You keep moving to Arizona and Montana and messing up our states also. So would you just make those people stay there? When they talk about building a wall, I want one, I want one, I want a wall off California. All right, go ahead. So uh, activism. Michelle, you want to stick with the topic of the complexity, or do we roll to Todd to talk about when they're in conflict with each other? Doesn't matter to me. I'm happy to go. Uh, or Todd. It doesn't matter to me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go. And I did want to point out something to kind of play off of what you were saying. There's been a very different approach in Europe compared to North America with these activist groups. Those activist groups in, in Europe took a very much took a legislative approach to a lot of these things. 
And so instead of appealing to yeah, consumers actually indirectly through uh, their direct suppliers like they did in the U.S., they went directly to uh, legislatures. And, and this was facilitated in a lot of ways by the transition to the European Union. Uh, but I talked to a couple of folks from Europe about these types of, of issues with activists. And, and I told them that the angle a lot of times here is, you know, we need to address these issues so that they don't become, so it doesn't get legislated. And the feedback I thought was interesting from them was, yeah, the difference between the way you guys are doing it and the way we're doing it here in Europe is it's faster here, but it's in some ways more permanent the way you guys are doing it. So once they make progress, it almost becomes permanent that, that some of these legislative solutions can go back and forth. And as, you know, political winds change, you can kind of see some ebbing and flowing. But they said when it when it's done, the way it's being done in North America through the consumer appeals to direct suppliers, that really doesn't go back the, the other direction. So once you lose ground there, it's very difficult, almost impossible to get ground back. So I thought that was just sort of an interesting perspective. I'm not sure I 100% agree with it, but it certainly is, it, it certainly makes you think because we think of legislation being, you know, it's kind of being the, the, the worst possible thing that could happen. And at least we can negotiate with, with these suppliers and try to help them understand our business and stuff like that. But from their perspective, uh, the way they're doing it in Europe may be faster, but it's even, but it's less permanent the way we're doing it here. So I guess to kind of transition a little bit into kind of what I wanted to talk about, um, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about a lot is, is understanding the arguments that the activist groups are making and understanding the fact that their arguments are almost exclusively emotionally based. So they're very compelling narratives that, that appeal to emotions. And I was on, on Damien's podcast on the, the Do Business Better podcast recently talking about uh, rhetorical appeals. And, and so I've been talking a lot about that lately. So if you want a little more detail, you can go listen to that. But, uh, but basically the idea that we talked about is that the activists tend to use appeals to emotion. And we tend, on the industry side, tend to use appeals to logic. And, and basically what we're saying is those logical appeals are less effective than the emotional appeals. Hey, Todd, real quickly, just for fun, because they probably haven't heard it, but Todd does a really good job in that episode, and I'll send it to you, but there's three, uh, and he studied the, the thing that, uh, who, Socrates, who is it, Plato? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, Aristotle. Pernicus. Okay, the three methods of appeal are, yeah, so they're, they're ethos, pathos, and logos in Greek, but basically it appeals to uh, authority, appeals to emotion, and appeals to logic. And so appeals to authority are all based on credibility. So, you know, if you say you should believe me uh, about this health-related thing because I'm a doctor, that's an appeal to authority. Or if you say, you know, I have 30 years experience in this field, so you should listen to me, that's an appeal to authority. An appeal to emotion is based on an emotion. So it's trying to elicit uh, an emotional uh, a response there. So you're trying to say, okay, well, I, you should do this. I'm persuading you to do this because if you don't, it will be negative for you. Or if you do, it will be positive for you. So you're either appealing to positive emotions like happiness and uh, things like that, or you're appealing to negative emotions like fear or anger. Um, and then the last one would be logos, which is, is logic, which is essentially pretty obvious. It's a, it's a facts-based discussion. And so what we talk about in that, that episode is that as a general rule, except in a couple of very specific examples, logical arguments tend to be much less effective. And so we tend to want to argue back and pick apart those arguments on a logical basis, and that tends to be less effective. So I've had these discussions, and I've tried to explain this to people, and then the feedback that I get is, okay, I understand what you're saying, but what does that mean? What can we actually do? How can we be more effective? And so what I've encouraged people to do is think about leading with emotional arguments and then using uh, logical arguments as supporting facts behind that, that argument. But one of the other things that I've been focusing on is, is where I think this is relevant here, and that is in exploiting contradictions. 
Okay, so there's a few things that are almost universally disliked among the human race. Okay, uh, some of those things are, are people don't like to be manipulated. I don't know anybody that enjoys being manipulated. Uh, people don't like inauthenticity, uh, inauthenticity or uh, insincerity or disingenuousness or however you want to describe that. Um, and then another one is contradictions. People don't like contradictions. Okay. Those are all th all those three things are, are related, and I think there's an opportunity here to exploit this on the contradiction side. So everybody to be contradictory is to be human, I suppose is, is probably a reasonable statement. We all have our own internal contradictions, right? And and, and some of those we just ignore uh, to maintain our sanity, um, but we don't have a lot of of of, of sympathy for other people's contradictions okay so you see this a lot in in politics so one of the most effect, effective anti uh, uh politician moves is to call somebody a flip-flopper right it was very effective in the in the Kerry bush campaign but it but it's been used many many times and they use it because it's effective and so what you're saying is there's there's contradictions and so what you're really implying there uh, is, is uh, there's an underlying implication there that appeals to a stereotype of politicians that they're just pandering, glad handing, they'll do whatever they have to do to get elected. Okay, so that's your underlying implication. So it gets back to that inauthenticity or that uh, manipulation as well. Um, but it is extremely effective because people don't like to, to they, they're very uncomfortable with these contradictions. These contradictions come up often in these activist uh, approach, approaches for a couple of reasons. And one of those I think is because they're trying to develop a compelling narrative. So it's all built around the narrative. And, and when you build a narrative around emotions, you're gonna have some inconvenient facts that pop up, right? So you're trying to keep this simple so that people can understand it. Um, but what that creates is, is some, some logical problems, okay? And those logical problems, and I think this is a little bit of what Michelle is gonna talk about, is there's a good reason why they're contradictory, and it's because there's a lot of unknowns out there, okay? And, and so what they're trying to do is simplify, ultra simplify very complicated topics. And what that creates to some degree is contradictions. And I think we can exploit those contradictions uh, very effectively. So let me give you a non-ag example real quick. Climate activists are uh, opposed to burning fossil fuels, okay? But they're also opposed to things like fracking and clean coal, okay? Um, and so ultimately what they're saying is they're, they're trying to reduce the impact on the environment, but in the short term, that's the quickest way we can reduce the impact on the environment, but they're opposed to that. Even more bizarrely, they're almost exclusively opposed to nuclear energy, which is really the only viable, at least right now, the only viable, uh, economically viable alternative to fossil fuels. Okay. And so it creates these, these contradictions and, and those are opportunities that we can exploit. So real quickly to bring it back to agriculture, uh, one of the ones I like to talk about a lot is there's a lot of overlap between the vegetarian movement and the natural food movement. Okay. So if you just talk about people, are you, do you identify with the natural food movement? And then ask somebody, do you identify with a vegetarian or vegan movement? There's going to be a ton of overlap there. So vegetarians tend to be very supportive of plant-based meat alternatives, okay? But those products are very highly processed, okay? And so if you're an anti or a natural food, anti-processed food advocate, um, it's a really tough contradiction to deal with. And so instead of replying to that, responding to these plant-based uh, meat alternatives directly, we can, we can respond indirectly. So plant-based meat company says you should eat our product and not eat meat because it's damaging to the environment and it's bad for your health. Our natural response as an industry is to come back and say, well, no, it's not bad for your health and here's why. That's a logical argument. Or it's, it's not bad for the environment and here's why. That's a logical argument. It's really complicated. You're going to end up getting stuck in the weeds there. Or they can go back and say, well, your product has an environmental impact as well. But again, that is a logical argument. You're going to end up getting stuck in the weeds. So an alternative could be to identify 
this overlap between the natural food movement and the vegetarian movement and attack them there and say, well, I don't know exactly what natural food means, but whatever unnatural food means, this definitely qualifies. This is a highly processed, it's one of the most highly processed foods in the world. Okay, so how can you rail against, you know, high fructose corn syrup because it's a processed food and then support a plant-based meat alternative that is, you know, inarguably highly processed? So it's just a little bit different angle, and, and I think that would be a lot more effective. We can continue to do the logical rebuttals. We, we need to do that. We've got science on our side. We need to take advantage of that. But these emotional arguments are going to be a lot more effective. And, and that's, a, that's an, an example of a way that we can use that contradiction to create a, a gap, to create an, a, an, a, an emotion that we can exploit. We're essentially exploiting the fact that people are uncomfortable with these contradictions. And so, you know, I think that's just a little bit different way of looking at it, and I think it kind of brings this concept to a more practical level, and I think it's something that as an industry we should, we should think more about and try to figure out um, how we can exploit that. I'm listening to an audio book right now called Catalyst. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. It's exactly, it sums up exactly what you just said, you know, looking at uh, this fact-based uh, rebuttals has just not worked for years in ag. We just have to stop it. I mean, just everybody quit. It doesn't work. I mean, you can't appeal to the common sense side of folks. And it's, I mean, it, it goes into a great case study about how Acura built up a better client base for their cars versus Buick, you know, what Buick did versus what Acura did. And we in ag just keep going back and behaving like Buick, you know? So I think uh, if you're looking for a, a good audio book to read, one to take in pretty quickly, it helps, uh, helps on the messaging side of stuff. Catalyst is a good response, you know, and it, because it talks about how to handle these things the way hostage negotiators handle it. You know, I think that stuff is everything you said, Todd, is spot on. It needs to in and this does a very good job of kind of putting some real real life current marketplace examples into uh in, into how to go about doing that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. And one of the one of the feedback pieces that I get to is is like I said, you know, we talk about the rhetorical appeals and people say, okay, so what, what does that mean? What is it, you know, what other, what do we really need to do? And then the other piece of feedback I get is if it's so ineffective, why do we keep doing it? Um, one of the reasons I think is because I, I, I offered a little carve out there and I didn't, and didn't share much details on the podcast with Damien. I did go into a little more detail on this, but I'll hit it real quickly here. There are a couple of scenarios where logical appeals are very effective. Okay. They're very effective when two experts are communicating with each other, okay, because, you know, supposedly at least you're taking a lot of the emotion out of there, and then you already have a shared sense of authority. And so the only one that's left, the only real uh, appeal that you have left to be effective in that type of communication, where you have equals uh, from a from a authority standpoint or credibility standpoint that are trying to at least nominally avoiding uh, emotion, you have two scientists discussing things, they're going to talk in the, in the terms of logical appeals a lot, okay? So that's one area where it's, it's really common. Now, as Damien pointed out on the podcast, even though they say there's no emotion there or they're trying to get away from emotion, there is emotion there, but, but certainly that's going to be an effective way to approach it because that's the way they, they see things. The other place that it's effective is when you're trying to convince someone that generally agrees with you. So if I'm generally a Michelle Klieger fan and I support, you know, Michelle's approach to life and I'm, a, you know, I, I align with a lot of her values, but she's trying to convince me of something that I might be a little bit on the fence about, I'm going to be very responsive to any sort of logical arguments there. Because really I'm already convinced, I just need to rationalize my position. Right. And so when we're talking to people, when you're talking to the Corn Growers Association and you're reinforcing everything that they've ever said about what it's like to be a corn grower, that that will strengthen your relationship with them. That's an effective appeal with them. And so I think a lot of times what happens is we're doing this internally within ag, making these logical appeals and everybody's responding back saying, yeah, all your other ag friends are saying, yeah, that's right. You know, you got it. You know, you're great. Um, but when we're actually trying to persuade people that aren't generally on our side, 
that's when they're 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 less effective. So we just need to be aware of of applications where logical arguments can be effective, but at the same time recognize that in, if we're trying to convert a vegetarian into thinking about eating meat or 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 any really sort of activist that might have anti-ag uh, you know tendencies, those arguments are not going to be very effective. We got a we got a marketing person on here, obviously with Allie, and I was uh, uh, sending her a message when you were talking about this to make sure that she uh, pounds this into the head of her ag clients because you'll tell them, hey, we're going to use emotion to move the needle. I've got this going on right now with milk in Georgia. I put up billboards all over Georgia that say nut milk is not milk. It's bold. It gets people talking, and all these. Georgia dairy farmers keep saying, yeah, bottle of is going to sell milk. I think you all put up billboards, tell them how much. And they go the same thing about how wonderful cow's milk is and this and that. And I said, has that moved the needle for 40 years of declining consumption? Let's get people buzzing and emotional. And our next one is going to be a uh, appeal to emotion. And we're going to say studies show that 80% of uh, COVID patients are vitamin D deficient. Oh, that's emotion because it's actually a bit of a scare tactic. We do this wrong in ag, uh, and I, I'll, everybody has been in my audience knows I talk about it at great length, but um, I will say that I became buddies with Andy, who's on the call right now as he's driving around a tractor, and Andy might remember that our relationship began with him fighting with me on Twitter, and because I pointed out that what organic, the organic trade tends to do is the organic trade tends to use pure emotion and fear. Five years ago, when you walked into Whole Foods, it said, be healthy, eat organic. You know, so that's the thing. So the organic, now they've gotten a bit away from it. They, they, they've backed off a little bit, it appears to me from a marketing standpoint. But hence, you know, obviously I have no problem with Andy. I have no problem with making more money by selling organic food, by growing stuff, they can get more premium on it. It all makes sense. But the marketing side of it, it was always usually, always was emotion, and it was generally kind of a fearful emotion. So, all right. So we talked about the conflict industry as an industry, which is very profitable for those that are in the role of PR attorney. Remember, Humane Society of the United States mostly employs attorneys. What do they do? They create legislation to put on the ballot in places like California. So uh, I talked about being an industry. Todd just talked about the conflict industry somewhat being in conflict with itself because this cause versus this cause, they're kind of actually looking for disparate outcomes. Michelle's going to talk about the complexity of this entire thing uh, and how there's a lot bigger issues here than we sometimes realize. So I would start with that most of the most causes, right, have some fundamental thing that they're trying to build around and whether it's, you know, humane treatment of animals or better conditions about the environment or better worker safety or better food safety. It, it's, a, it's a simple sentence that that you can get behind. And this is actually how we start trade negotiations, right? You set up a framework that hopefully you can get everybody to agree to because the framework, the high level is the easy point. Um, and then you start to populate the details, always going back to the point, well, this is what I want and it supports our mission. So you should, you know, it supports these frameworks that we all agreed to. And, and, and that tends to work, um, but the problem is that that really big one, right? We, we want animals to be traded humanely. We want workers to be taken care of. We want to improve, um, reduce water runoff. Whatever it is, is a lot easier to point out than it actually ever is to execute. Um, and so that is where I think a lot of the, the devil gets lost in the details. And so, one, some of the examples that I've come up with are places where, you know, either we're trying to accomplish one thing, which might be better food safety, right? And as a result, we pass a regulation. So 40 states at one point or another have had regulations that anybody that works with food has to wear gloves, right? And that makes sense to most of us. If you're wearing gloves, then you're going to, you know, reduce food transmitted diseases. Fine. Um, and this applies to, and so that makes sense and we can all agree. However, when you like impose, put these laws into effect or these regulations into effect, we start to see how it, it 
breaks down and, and the places that there are challenges. So the first people that were really against this were sushi chefs. They work with their bare hands if they put and they prepare the sticky rice. As soon as they put gloves on to make your roll, all of the rice is stuck to their gloves and not to your roll. So this one inhibits them from doing their job. But taking it to the next step, uh, research then looking at studies shows a few things. One, that when we wear gloves, we tend to underestimate risk. So if you ride your bicycle, you are generally safe and on the side of the road. If you're not wearing a helmet, you're thinking about, I don't wanna fall and break my head. Uh, and so you're more conscious. And if you watch the same people on bicycles, when they have a helmet on, they are much more aggressive riders. And so the same thing happens. I'm wearing these gloves because I'm reducing food contamination, but I'm not changing them when I'm handling money. I'm not changing them when I'm switching between dishes. I'm not looking for cuts in them. My hands are getting sweaty and I might be getting cuts and now I'm creating more problems. And so this plan that was designed to achieve a goal that most people can get behind is actually making the problem worse. Also, it then is going to impact another set of goals that people want. And so reducing waste, especially plastic waste, is also a popular cause. But if I make you change your gloves 10 times an hour, I'm producing a ton of plastic waste. And so like Todd said, I might have the same people that are both interested in eating healthy food and reducing environmental waste. And unfortunately, those goals in this case are in conflict with each other. And so it seems like a logical path that we went down. However, the, it's always more complicated. And then we get to the part where it's difficult to educate consumers. And so uh, Todd talked about what, you know, processing and whether consumers want this product, if they want all natural and they don't want high fructose corn syrup, why do they want a veggie patty that's been processed a million times? And I think that getting to that point of processing, of, of what the definition of processing is a huge undertaking. Um, and I, you see all of these specialty brands that say limited processing, but the chicken is cut, it's deboned, it's pre-cooked, it's, it's a million things that are processed. And so to start with the consumer and say, well, wait a second, processing means wiping the dirt off of it. It means chopping your carrots into this packaging you want. It means washing them. It means pushing, putting them in the package. Like those are all ways that it is processed from the field. So we have simple goals that we're trying to talk to that are complicated in practice. Then we have a level of education that is impossible to achieve. Um, and, and then it continues with um, the practicalities, right? I might expect a consumer to have an idea that if I've cut their onions and I'm now selling them diced onions, that it was processed. It didn't come out of the field that way. But can I really expect the average consumer to understand that that they are able, there seems to be an understanding that cow burps and farts cause methane and that's an environmental problem. But can I really expect them to then understand that by removing all livestock from the landscape, I am now removing this source uh, that is eating a lot of food that would end up in landfills. So whether it's spent gra grains that are going to um, to operations to eat. I grew up in Florida where all of the processed orange and grapefruit peels went to, dare, to cow um, feed because they love it. And so if we don't have these outlets, we're now creating more land waste and we have to find places to put it and we have to transport it. And so it might be that you are trying to have a positive environmental impact. And so it's something easy, right? cows eat a lot or they burp a lot or they fart a lot. And so I'm just going to eat less of them and I need less land because I could eat all the cabbage I want. Fine. But our system is really integrated. And so from the cow perspective, not only do I need to find a new place for home for these, but I've also changed the economics of the farms. The, the, the um, orange processors might eat, sell those oranges, or if they're not selling them, if they're just giving them away, they might have to pay somebody to remove them. They have to find a landfill for them. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated. 
and and I don't think that most consumers are there. So I I think it's interesting that exploiting the contradictions, like Todd said, and being part of this conversation, but trying to work off of what is that first high level emotional argument that the person is trying to um, fulfill. Are they trying to make sure that they have food safety? Are they trying to protect the environment? I mean, we talked about it with food miles a few weeks ago that, you know, not all food miles are the same. And so what is that goal that they're trying to achieve? And how then can we either speak to that goal and show that agriculture is not in conflict with that goal or have an emotional discussion about that goal? And anybody that says that agriculture is all about science, I really push back on because if you've talked to people about food, food is so personal and that is what creates this. At an international level, food security and being able to make your own food is important. At an in a personal level, it's part of our culture and identity. And so whether we want it to be or not, it might be our jobs and we might be able to, and I might look at spreadsheets and tell you how much money your farm can make um, or what the benefit is, but at the end of the day, the person that's eating the food, it's always personal too. And so aligning those arguments with what is that foundation? What is PETA trying to get at? And how do we make our message align with their message because we're not evil? I don't know that we're going to make our message align with what PETA or any of the other conflict industry groups are going to do. I think we uh, obviously need to uh, oppose them on their grounds, and that's where it's got to be about emotion. Uh, so I always point out the thing that th these people want to control your dinner plate. These people want to control what you're allowed to give your children. That's the angle that I take. And then you demonize them. The other part that we need to do as an industry, uh, just like I talked about how they use the useful idiots and Stalin's term, not mine, uh, that they use their followers and fans to go out and be their soldiers for free. <clears throat> yeah, the person in Washington, D.C. that's raking in half a million dollars a year through uh, the donations, all they have to do is just make sure they keep the religion going. And these causes do become new religions for the sign carrying um the kind of people that Animal Liberation Front is one of them, by the way, they are getting more radical. So PETA can try and take the high road. Oh, we just run commercials and we do all that. But they use their attorneys to defend people that are pro prosecuted for criminal trespass. Allie was saying it to me in a chat. We got a rancher that goes public and says, you know, here's what we do. We want to put good meat on your dinner plate so you can feed your children uh, uh, roast beef on Sunday. And then Animal Liberation Front has a bunch of zealots that tend to be younger and absolutely radical. They'll go to that rancher's property, burn his burn his barn down, you know, uh, or let the animals all loose, then burn the barn down, or do criminal stuff. PETA defends them, or at least sends out their attorneys on their behalf. Saw the one in Indiana a couple of years ago. You guys remember that? They got video of some, uh, you know, some of the Hispanic laborers throwing calves around, mistreating the calves. Uh, and that was one of these more upstarts. And it's called Animal Relief Movement, ARM, Animal Relief. I can't remember the name of it right now, but it doesn't matter. It's a more radical version of PETA. So you're seeing all this. And again, their stuff is pure emotion. Release the video. And then if they get arrested and can do a big video display of we're letting these animals loose, it appeals back to their own base. But if we can then say, no, you're criminals. And so that's where instead we tried to pass laws, ag gag laws is what then the radicals called them. We make it so that some person can't go on uh, uh, Hubner's farm as a pretend employee and then shoot video of something that's happening there and then use it against them. So the law comes out and then these radical groups say, well, you're just trying to pass ag gag laws to you know, reduce freedom of speech. So um, that's it. Um, uh, we really, we just got to, we got to point out what it is, criminal back activity and criminal behavior and all that. And again, that would be an emotional appeal because as Todd said, um, inauthenticity, et cetera, contradictions, when you say, well, these people are actually criminal, they're not just animal rights activists, they're criminal. Now it changes the vernacular. We lost Megan because she had to catch a meeting in New Zealand. We lost Ryan because he had to catch a meeting. Ryan says some really nice stuff in the chat, how uh, he's going to watch the rest of this because he's digging it. And um that's uh, we'll wrap this topic then. Todd, Michelle, one last thought. Allie, anybody? And then we're going to go to Carlena. I can't wait to hear from Carlena. So, 
Carlena, thank you for being here. Carlena Brown, it was on my podcast, my Business of Ag podcast about what, one year ago. She is in Fowler, Indiana, not too very far from where Mr. Hubner is sitting right now. She has a good story. She is in the shrimp business. And you're saying the shrimp business. I know a little bit about shrimp because I worked with the industry. About 94%, I think, of every shrimp that is consumed in the United States of America comes from a farm, and it comes from an overseas farm. Indonesia, India being the biggest producer, China, Vietnam, Ecuador, I just named the big ones. Almost none of it comes from the Gulf, even though you've all watched Forrest Gump and you thought that was cute. It's only just cute. Almost none of the shrimp you eat ever comes from the Gulf unless you walk by the boat and buy it off of that guy. Generally, it comes from a farm in India. Carlena was not a farm girl. Carlena married a farm guy and he was like a lot of Midwestern people. He raised hogs and did like everybody else didn't make any money. There's the setup. Carlena's a shrimp producer in Fowler, Indiana. Take it away, my dear. Yeah, we do. Uh, that's actually how we got into it was because where we used to live, we had about 5,000 head of hogs. They were subdividing all the way around us. We're going to be the most hated neighbor. So we moved to Fowler, Indiana, which is in the middle of nowhere. And we wanted to raise um, hogs still, but we moved up here in 91, 92 when the prices bottomed out. So for us to continue, they would have lost everything. Um, so aquaculture intrigued them. They're, they're farmers. They wanted livestock on the farm. So for 15 years, my husband and my father-in-law researched raising tilapia. But here was the problem. Everybody wants a million, two million of your dollars to set up a small operation, but nobody would ever let you in to see if they were actually raising fish. Finally, somebody allowed my husband and my mother-in-law in. They went in, they took a look. He didn't have any fish on his property, but he had developed a shrimp system. It was a lot cheaper for us to get into it. My in-laws thought, oh, this is a great way to get livestock on the farm. So in 2010, um, we went forward with the shrimp farm. Now, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this. This was my husband and his dad's thing. But before the first building was completed, his dad passed away. I lied and told my husband I'd come out and help him. I really had no intention of working this farm whatsoever. I was just going to come out and dip shrimp and take it home for dinner. But um, on day first day, we ha didn't have shrimp yet, but he was working with the test kit because we have to test our water all the time. It took him five hours to test one tank. And we were starting with six production tanks and two nursery tanks. I'm multitask everything. So I came out on day two to teach him how to do the testing better. I'm here 10 years later. I've missed three days of work in that entire time. I would have never thought this would be the thing that I enjoy the most in my entire life. I love getting up every morning and coming to work. Is it easy work? No, but I love every minute of it. It's not even work to me. So what we actually do here is we raise our shrimp in what's called a bioflop system. I have um, a bacteria-based water. So what we have to do is we have to maintain the water every single day so that the shrimp thrive. If the water goes off a little bit, they're true divas, they'll stress and they'll die. So it's very important for us to balance and maintain the water every single day. And the only way to do that is by testing because what's unique about my water, it's brown. You cannot see the shrimp unless we dip them out. So like most people have an aquarium, you can see if your fish are dead. I don't get that luxury. I have to maintain the water in order to know. And like I said, we are now up to 19 production tanks. We have seven intermediate tanks, 10 nursery tanks that we run all the time. Um, we do not breed our own um, PLs or post larvae or the babies here. Um, I would love to. I have spent three weeks in Vietnam trying to learn how to do it because the hatcheries here in the U.S. will not allow me onto their farms. Um, so, but the cost is the biggest thing that holds us back. I have to spend over a million dollars to equip a room. It's probably about 15 by 20. And I'm going to have to sell 55 million PLs every month for the next 15 years before I'll break even. Okay, so, hey, Carlina, 
a few things. Um, you're, you're talking the vernacular that you know, a few of us don't. You have explained what a PL is. You just said something about the production tanks. Now, bearing in mind that everybody on this call knows that Northwest or West Central Indiana is certainly not tropical, whereas in India, they're growing shrimp in what might be a clean or it might be a disgustingly polluted pool, we don't know, outside. You're growing these inside of barns. Did you build these barns from scratch? Did you retrofit hog buildings? Talk a little bit about that. And then you told me on the podcast what your tanks are um, and, and how big they are. Because I think that'd be interesting from the production side. Then I want you to obviously talk about where the product goes. But let's talk about a bit more on the production. Then we'll talk about where it goes. Because I think it's fascinating. The woman sells shrimp for double what you'd pay at the grocery store and she gets it. But let's go to the production. Yeah, what it is, is um, we actually, we do have part of it in a hundred year old barn that we did retrofit a little bit, but the other three buildings are new buildings um, that we had built. They're just storage sheds that we built for this business. Um, what we actually use for our tanks are above ground swimming pools. Um, we do that for a reason to keep the costs down. They last about three to four years, so we don't replace them very often. And um, the PLs, I'm sorry, stands for post larval. It just means they're babies. Okay, so they're they're uh, juvenile they're juvenile shrimps. Um, the buildings. If I walked in there, uh, what would be the temperature? Because obviously it's you know we just had nine inches of snow at the farm here last week. So what's the temperature in your barns, and what does it need to be to keep these shrimps going? Right now, my barn is about the same as it is all year long, whether it's negative fifty five or one hundred and five degrees outside. Our interior barns run at about eighty two to eighty four degrees with about a 90% humidity, so, but yeah, it's not comfortable to work in at all. Yeah, you've got a certain expense in keeping it that way, obviously, when it's when it's cold outside, you're keeping it 82 degrees. The pools, you said you buy above ground swim pools, you put these shrimp in there. Tell me about the turn. When you put in a, a juvenile, a post PL. PL, you put it in there, when does it come out and get uh, put on somebody's plate? We get them in when they're roughly about 10 days old and we're selling them in 150 days. So they're about five months in our facility. Okay. So hundred. So, so it's a, it's 160 days till growth and maturity. All right. So uh, anybody have a question on the production before we talk about the business side of it? Cause then she's got another business that I want you all to know about too. Anybody got questions? Yeah, yes. Carlina, I, I, I've, I've talked to some people uh, that developed some systems for shrimp. And I've always thought, every time I've heard these presentations, I've always thought this would be a perfect contract production model, you know, where somebody could do the breeding piece and you maybe have some of their own production, but that you could basically contract out these facilities. Is anybody doing that? Or I just maybe what are your thoughts on that? Um, it just seems like a way for smallholder rural families to be able to generate some income. And if you had a program that you could, you know, almost franchise out and, and they could uh, they could just sign into your program and have very little risk because they were contract producers. Uh, it just seems like it's a, a, a potential a potential model that could make a lot of sense there. It does make a lot of sense, but here's the problem with it. Because the shrimp are what we call divas. I mean, they're very touchy as far as their water goes. I mean, you can lose your entire tank of shrimp just because you didn't pay attention to the alkalinity. So we've actually did this early on and it didn't work very well for us. We would contract out people to grow for us. Um, we actually did it in Maryland with a couple of farms out there and they were producing what we were being able to sell. So that makes for a problem there because they really didn't have the skin in the game. So what we do is we offer it as your own business. We guide you through every step to produce what you need and to get you going. But the thing is that you've got to have the skin in the game because what we were finding out is people were only testing their water once a week. And then I'm planning on selling at least 50 to 60% of your shrimp and you only produce 10%. Now I'm in trouble with the retail side of it or my clients because I can't supply what they wanted. And now they're not real happy. So that's the downfall with this whole thing because until we can figure out, because it is a bacteria-based water, it's the bacteria that controls everything. And bacteria is bacteria, and sometimes she does her own thing. And if you're not paying attention, you're going to lose your entire tank of shrimp. And it's we've a, seen people that test once a week. That's a, it's a great point, and, and I know you've got a little bit of background on the hog side. And that's the problem there, too, is production risk. 
who takes the production risk? You know, on one hand, there's some real advantages for the companies that take the production risk uh, uh, because, you know, it, it just simplifies the process. But that reduces the incentive for the producer to do a good job. So uh, really interesting there that it's the same issue. I mean, they're, they're probably a little more sensitive um, than, than pigs are, but certainly it's the same concept. It's the exact same concept. Because like that's exactly what we tried to do in Maryland. We actually got four farmers to sign up and we worked with them and we were finding out later on that they weren't doing what was being asked and they're producing less than 10%. Well, we're selling more than that. When so, you lose a tank of shrimp, how many are you losing? How many pounds of shrimp are you losing? Depends on the size of your tank. We run 14 and 16 footers, but the farms we're working with in Maryland were 18 footers, and you're losing anywhere from 300 to 400 pounds in an 18 foot tank. Three to 400 pounds. Three to 400 okay. pounds. And obviously, if there if there's not much growth on them, if you lose them in the first month, your loss is a hell of a lot better, worse. I'm sorry, more manageable than if you lose them in the fifth month when you're talking about edible sized shrimp. So yeah. three to 400 pounds per swimming pool is what I'm hearing. For the 18 foot, our yeah. 14 footers, the maximum we're ever going to produce out of them is about 130, maybe 140 pounds. Okay. Car Carlina, how long is the cleanup cleanup time between batches within the tanks? What's that process look like? Um, it's usually about two to two and a half hours because we will totally drain the tank, remove any remaining shrimp, and we clean them with water and a scrub brush only. No chemicals or whatever are allowed in our facility. And then we usually pump the water back in and the next batch of shrimp are going in either the end of that day or the very next day. Gotcha. We can't let that bacteria sit for more than 24 hours without shrimp in it. That's key because you talk about like, I'm sure what Doug was getting at, you know, I looked at once a contract duck barn, my brother, and I gonna put up two contract duck barns. And there's always this thing of, well, if you have a disease problem, that's on you. And then we're going to yank birds. And like, well, if my facility has to sit for six weeks for a cleanup and I'm without birds. It means the margins on this being a contract duck producer were essentially you only made about six weeks of a year was actually your profit. So, uh, and, and that was a concern there. All right. If we're good on production, I think that she needs to talk about the business side of it because I was really pretty fascinated by that. Obviously, she's she's not an ag person. She she you know, and then we know the hog thing. And then this thing started eleven years ago. You're thinking, okay, great. Somewhere in there's a complete infrastructure on how you are an India uh, producer of you know tons and tons of shrimp, and then somehow they go to a processor and they go through seafood brokers and they end up getting shipped to you know Seattle, and then they get distributed around the country the hell do you do with a bunch of shrimp in Fowler, Indiana? We sell everything we grow. Um, what we do is we actually sell our shrimp live. By selling it live, that's how we can differentiate between the grocery store shrimp. If I was to process it, who's going to really know the difference? The head tells us the freshness of the product because it will last for two days with the head on. And since there's no debating on shrimp, there's absolutely nothing in it but water, salt, and protein from their feet. There's nothing else in that mud vein, so there's no point in veining them. But what most people don't realize, you want to cook a shrimp with its head on. The head adds a beautiful sweetness into the meat that's unbelievable. Now, a lot of our clients eat the head. I have no desire to ever eat the head. Um, but they tell me it tastes just as good as the shrimp. Our meat is firmer than what we're used to. But by us not processing it, and you can understand, I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. I have to drive 11 miles to get a gallon of milk. That's how far, and it's not even a Walmart. And we have, we sell roughly around 500 pounds of shrimp at our front door just about every month. 500, saying again, you sell 500 pounds of shrimp at your, right there where you produce them monthly? Monthly. Okay, so 500 pounds a month. Star, but December, we're a little bit more. When you get to holiday time and you mentioned Super Bowl Sunday is a big one. Mm -hmm. All right, so in the middle of nowhere, people come to your facility and you've got 500 pounds a month. And if you don't mind, since we're all uh, in this group for a reason, your sale price average? We sell our shrimp at $18 a pound. $18 per pound. If someone says, I want to buy 50 pounds, do we haggle? We give them $2 off. If you okay. go to hundred pounds, we give you $3 off. Okay. What's your average, you know, sale size, two pounds? Right now for Super Bowl, we're ravaging five to 10 pounds. For Super okay, Bowl, but not, on average, most people coming in two to three pounds. Okay, and then uh, your 
cost obviously is the, the feed, the facility, the time, the labor, and then the PLs as you call them, et cetera. You're selling them non-processed obviously saves you money. Uh, I'm sure you get a little blowback on that. It's like, wait a minute, you're selling this thing that I've got to clean and I'm paying a premium price for it, right? That's just it. We teach them they don't have to clean it. And that's what they like. You can cook the shrimp straight as is, straight off. What we, you know, pull it right out of your package, put it right on your grill, throw it right in your skillet, boil it, whatever you want. You don't have to do anything to it. Um, on an hours basis, you got this is kind of this is your job. Who, who, who? How many people are involved? How many man hours? I'm sorry, women. How many human hours are put into it in a month or in a month, for instance? Uh, right now, it, it only takes us about three to four hours a day to run everything. Okay. As far as the actual production of the shrimp. But since we also offer tourism and a lot of other things that we have going on here, um, but the actual shrimp itself, three to four hours, and it's two people. Okay. And that's you know, what I was going to get to also that I think is brilliant is that you had somebody come and ask you about doing this business. And then you essentially now are a shrimp consultant. So, and then you said agritourism. So two other ways that you're picking up a little bit of revenue, uh, go with both of those, please. Yeah, we, um, like I said, our economic developer actually is the one that introduces tourism. I had no desire to, I never thought anybody wanted to come and see a shrimp farm. I mean, I thought really, the bunch of swimming pools in a barn. I really thought nobody would ever come to do it. So we do a lot of tours now. Um, we do a lot of FFA school tours. Um, I actually go to, there's three classes over at Purdue that I would go to every semester for the last five years, give them a talk. And then they would usually bring that class over for the tour. And we only charge $5 a head for those tours. Um, we have a PowerPoint presentation. They get a tour of the facility. Depending on their age, we actually offer what we call shrimp fishing. So they can go fishing in a tank for shrimp. Um, and then they get a sampling of the shrimp. And so we bring them back for that. Um, but we do offer consulting to help people get set up in shrimp farming. I have no intention to be the largest shrimp farmer. I, I don't, I'm getting up there in age. I like what I have, but I have no desire to work that hard anymore. But um, we've been trying to get more people to understand the product that we're actually offering. Because the more people that know about this type of shrimp, they're going to buy it. And that's how we're going to be able to sell more and get rid of the imported product. Okay. So you make a little bit of money on the tourism. How much, how much of the business then is setting up other shrimp farmers? Probably about 5%. Okay. So 10 grand a year or something like this that you'd get by being a shrimp consultant. A bit off of consulting, uh, but we make no money off of our equipment. Um, because it's not about us selling the equipment and making money. It's about us getting them into the business. Because again, it's kind of like what we call marketing 101. If there was a shrimp farm across the street from me, that's going to draw more people to my area, which means I get to sell more shrimp. Even though we're selling the same product, we can actually help each other out. He may sell wholesale, I may sell retail. And so he's going into the restaurants and I'm selling to the people coming in here. Do you go to the, that's the last question for me and we'll hear from everybody else. Restaurants, uh, you know, about four pounds of shrimp per American per year is our consumption. It's the most consumed seafood. I do know that from my time with the shrimp people, but a lot of it is consumed out of the home. Restaurants are not, uh, we're not open. So what's that mean to you? Well, we were actually shut down for a little while due to COVID, but once we started opening up, we started selling again. Um, but we did, we were in two restaurants, they were in Chicago, and, and since Chicago is still kind of shut down, um, right now they're not willing to take any of our product, but they only got it for the weekend, and we limited how much shrimp they could get, because if they froze my product, they're never going to buy from me again, they'll go and buy the $7 pound strip. What about, the, you know, you talk about you, you were shut down. You can't just uh, not feed them. So you just held them back, like in the hog business, we're just holding back. Yeah, we kept them going. Um, like I said, when we finally were able to open up, um, we actually, we had some really jumbo shrimp and those things went very quickly. We, our particular brand that we raised, which are the El Vanamese with Pacific Whites, if they get to about 25 grams in weight, their meat becomes tough on them. And that's what we were selling because they were about that size. We never thought we were going to be shut down that long. So was it a tougher product? It was a tougher product. We, we did get a couple of complaints on it, 
and I sat there and I told him, I said, I told you all that went these big ones. That they took them does the feed half. efficiency, does the feed efficiency change at the heavier weights? No, I actually believe it or not, it's still um, about one to one. So that's the other thing. So shrimp are a one to one ratio on feed conversion? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? I think this is fascinating, but we got to get to the market segment report and the lightning round. Anybody got anything for Carolina? Real quick, what, what do you feed them? They're actually fed a protein-based diet. It consists of fish meal, corn meal, and soy meal. Is that a pellet? It is a pellet. It's an extruded pellet, and it starts out very, very small, and then it works its way up to about two milligrams. Or two Did milligrams. you have trouble finding somebody to make that feed for you? There are only two places in the U.S. that does it. One is Ziegler and the other one is Cargill. So Ziegler's out of Pennsylvania. It comes from where? Ziegler in Pennsylvania. They've got almost 50 years of research into fish and shrimp food. And the food that we do, they actually design specifically for our facility. Cool. I think it's fascinating. I think you're going to be getting somebody that's going to come and take a tour. Uh, maybe Mr. Ambriel. Uh, that would be great. We'd love to check it around. <laughs> we'll come together. Doug, Doug and Ambriel can come together. You know what? Pick up the whole trifecta. You got, you got Smith, Jim right here. He's only he's only over by me. He could come up and see it. All right. All right. Um, I, can, I can be there in 35 minutes. So I'm here until five today. <laughs> hey, stop, hey stop, stop in Lafayette and pick up some milk on the way because apparently there ain't no milk out there where she is. <laughs> All right. So, um, <clears throat> Market segment report, Mr. Fargo, he's already talked a little bit about California regulatory environment. Now he's going to talk about ag retail uh, for a couple minutes. What's going on in the business? What are you, what are you seeing with your members? Um, a little bit more on California, the People's Republic of California here. Um, issues that they're really hounding our, our retailers with is water. Uh, they're they're going to try, try to control the water in California, and that's how they're going to leverage everything that takes place in the state. CARB compliance, there's a there's a policy in place that by 2023, you have to replace all of your diesel engines in California with CARB compliant. Uh, if you think about that in the county I live in, there's 400 registered crops here. And so a farmer or grower here specializes in manufacturing a piece of equipment that will harvest cocktail onions and it may have a diesel engine in it and he only runs it for three weeks out of the entire year and then parks it. Well, now he's got to take that apart, put a new engine in it or, or custom make something all over again. So every diesel engine in the state of California has to be replaced and be carb compliant. I live in a state where if the wind blows, they turn the power off because they don't want power lines to start fires. Or if it's 108 degrees, we can't air condition everybody. So I bought a generator. I couldn't have it shipped to me in California because it, it wasn't carb compliant. Um, labor and healthcare mandates are going to impact the farm workers. Um, and then something else that's happening right now in California is we have a mill tax on all of our crop protection products. Right now, if, uh, if you buy crop protection goods, it's about 2.1 cent on every dollar. And if you have a caution label on your product going forward, that's going to increase by 25%. If your product has a warning label on it, it's gonna increase by 35%. And if you have a danger label, you're looking at a 50% increase on your mill tax in the state of California. So they're they're continually hammering the grower and the retailer here in this state. Mill tax, real quick. Mill tax is a self-supporting tax that helps the department, uh, uh, DPR, Department of uh, Pesticide Regulation in the state of California. So depending on how toxic or how many, what the stuff is on the label, it's going to be increased by incremental amounts based on how, how evil the, the chemistry is. Correct. Correct. Um, from a, from a logistics standpoint, um, Long Beach, LA harbors, uh, Oakland, Sacramento, uh, these places are backed up with freight right now. We're seeing 50 to 60 ships, uh, out in port right now that cannot get unloaded. At the docks, we're seeing empty containers piling up that they don't know what to do with. So they're literally shuffling these containers around. But yet in China, they don't have empty containers. So they're building new ones. Nobody wants to ship empty containers back into China to get the goods we need. So we're seeing right now that 
there, there could be anywhere from a three to eight week delay in getting some goods and in, in what I'm talking about is crop protection products out of the China area. Um, we're recommending to all of our retailers, make sure you have probably two thirds at least of your goods in your barn right now that you need for the year and start ordering, put orders in right now because the delays are going to hit the US marketplace come uh, mid spring here, March, April, May. So this is interesting because I wonder, we talked about this when I was on a call with BASF, I believe it was during the summer, like May. And I started predicting that if you were too dependent for uh, your crop inputs from China between trade wars and then just the, you know, once the, once the chain gets a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a kink in it, you're a problem. So there's going to be, you think, uh, a shortage of supply for crop protection, uh, chemistry, that comes from China, certainly by, by May. And I don't think this is gonna be a, a catastrophic issue, but if you can't get the product you need to your herbicide when your weeds are two inches tall, because it's tied up on a ship in a port somewhere, you're gonna spend more money to kill that weed when it's eight inches tall, when you go to something else that might be available. So sounds economically, good. it's going to impact us. Sounds good for the organic guy, Andy. It, you know, your, uh, your, your stuff's gonna go up. Gonna be, it's gonna be you didn't hear about the diesel engine stuff, did you? <laughs> That's not going to help at all. No, it's not. but it's not helping. It's not happening in Indiana. It's happening in California, and then that's not a regulation they can necessarily uh, then de facto make it a federal regulation, though, right? That's just California, right, Jim? Yeah, that's California right now. But everything starts here, like like we said earlier. Yeah. Um, from a from a higher level perspective, growers appear to have more cash to spend right now. Uh, when we look at prepay and prepay opportunities, when the growers come into our retailers in December and offer us cash for discount on their purchases throughout the year, prepay dollars were way up this year, about twenty percent up, which was a very healthy increase. Um, they seem to be buying land, and um, seeing also that equipment sales are slightly up right now. So these growers have money. There's a little bit of confidence at their level, but that's also based on the fact that Biden has said he's gonna to continue to feed them some subsidies. That's yet to be seen, that's being worked out now, but there, as long as the subsidies are there, our growers are, are spending money. Yeah, I, um, I'm seeing it from my, my vantage point also. There seems to be good confidence uh, in, in among production level uh, agriculture, obviously in my part of the world or the, their part of the world with the commodity prices are up 80% on soybeans. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't take you know much more than that. Anybody got questions for Mr. Fargo for his market segment report? All right, a couple of things for the lightning round. Mr. Uh, Jim Smith is uh, going to expand his lamb operation to go more direct to consumer. So I do actually think there should be some tours of uh, what Carlene is doing over there when you're in the neighborhood because she's obviously got uh, a good deal figured out. She's got people to come to her door in a fairly remote area that's not close to a population center as much as you are, Jim. So you might be able to do some good there. And then I'm just thinking, as an ag guy that's been in the beef, you know, 13 years, I had my hobby beef business. You couldn't get processing dates because everybody with the pandemic decided I want to buy pig, lamb, beef from the consumer, the producer. Couldn't get it processed. Instead of making that a problem, I think you just do exactly what Carlana does. When these people show up at your place, give them a live sheep and say, "He see, it's better if you just start like this. She gives them a live damn shrimp. It says, live for two days if you don't even feed it. So you just sell them a live sheep and say, I don't care what you do with it, but you know what? It's, tell them it's better if you keep the head on. It tastes better if you keep the head on. <laughs> we already have that in our neighborhood with the Burmese and the Somalians. They come and buy them live. Yeah. Yeah. My brother and I sold some lambs and goats to uh, uh, I, an ethnic group that I can't even remember for sure what it was that uh, that they were into killing it themselves and processing it. And then we just we let them do it and had to you know, bear the guts. All right. Lightning hey, round. Damien, just to piggyback on what Jim Fargo is saying, we're already seeing the effects of the longshoreman strike and the container issue in the, life, the feed industry. The price of lysine's gone up 25%. Threonine's gone up about 25%. We're having a shortage of methionine. So that's making it more costly for us to replace expensive soybean meal. And we're also going to start seeing in the vitamin industry, since we have so many vitamins that are made in China, that 
you, you back up those containers. It doesn't matter where they are in the ocean. If they don't hit the dock, they can't get in feed. Okay, so we feed should be filling those numbers. containers with corn and soybeans and sending them back that way. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I had to turn them upside. I had to turn them. I have to turn them yeah. ninety degrees to to fill them the, from the top. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. So we're seeing it on feed. We're seeing it on crop inputs, and uh, a lot of people don't understand these supply chain problems. Aren't they? Don't go away in a week either. Sounds like it's a good time to buy some of these. Uh, if you wanted just some cheap storage, you can buy storage containers. It sounds like. Um, all right. We're doing this again on February 17th. Um, you know, I've got a couple of new people joining like Megan with hops. And I got, uh, I think some, uh, another person that's going to be joining us. Uh, so that's cool. Give us a little different perspective from different States, different industries, et cetera. Um, lightning round, Michelle. Um, so I'm just going to build off Todd, but that's okay. Um, as you wait, been wait, wait, then wait, then Todd. She wants to build off of your lightning round. I'll just I'll do mine really quick. It's a, a tool that I found really useful. It's an app called Asana, which is A S A N A, and it's a, I guess a, you'd call it a task manager, a project management app. Um, but for people that uh, struggle with uh, you know trying to figure out what am I going what do I need to be doing now. And uh, what do I need to be working on? Prioritizing tasks. It's really simple, really user friendly. There's a free version that will meet probably most people's needs. I think they have a paid version, but I've never paid for it. Um, it also is really effective for teams. So if you have a team that you're managing, and that doesn't even necessarily mean employees, uh, you can set up uh, different groups on there. Uh, so if you depend on somebody else to get something done in order to do your job, or if you're responsible for someone else doing something, uh, it can be an extremely valuable tool. There's others out there, and there may be others that work better with your ecosystem, but that's one that I've found really useful and i just feel like i'm just scratching the surface of it uh, so really great tool look into it uh, like i said it's free there's um uh, nothing to be lost by uh, trying it out but i think it's real simple and uh, could be life-changing for folks that struggle with similar things that i do so mine is along that right so especially with new year's resolutions it feels like everybody wants a new productivity tool if Asana works for you, great. I seem to be getting them in the mail now. Um, and my soapbox slash pet peeve is people that spend more time trying to write their to-do list and manage their to-do list than actually doing things off of their to-do list. So finding something that works for you that does not take a significant part of your day um, as opposed to making the to-do list a way to procrastinate and getting nothing done. That's fantastic. Mine is going to tie in, not what I promised I was going to do. I was going to do a different topic, but based on Michelle, she talked about human behavior and how if you watch people that are wearing bicycle helmets, they will behave more erratically or they'll ride more recklessly. So in Econ 415, I think it was, and I've never forgotten this, we discussed one day, the guy came in, the professor, and said, you've heard about guns and butter. You've heard about supply and demand curves. You know what economics really is at its very heart? It's about human decision-making and humans do what they can obviously are incentivized to do or what they can get away with. So in our dealing, since we're all smart ag professionals, it probably will make you stronger to always think about what, what motivates people and always understand that people will do what they can get away with. And sometimes they don't make a conscious decision. They just do it. <clears throat> it was 1991 when I took that class and we were just coming up with seatbelt laws and uh, airbags. And the professor then threw this out there as a premise. We think we're going to make people safer, but the reality is with airbags, people drive more recklessly. It's the same thing as Michelle just said. He said, what if instead of airbags in the steering column, we put poison darts so that when you hit something going faster than 20 miles per hour, a poison dart is released and it kills you. Instead of driving recklessly saying, oh shit, this car has airbags, you'd see a bunch of people driving very cautiously. So I would say that I can also reference stoplights. Here in Phoenix, where I live half of the year, they thought they're going to save everybody by putting a delay because people were running running red lights. So they made it so that once the red light turned red, there was an extra second and a half before the other side turned green. And the consumer certainly didn't probably think about it, but did just start running red lights more and more because they actually knew there was no peril in doing so. So always remember that people generally will do what they can get away with. And sometimes their decisions aren't necessarily like mapped out. They just do it because for instance, hey, 
I feel safer because there's an airbag. I'll drive more recklessly. There you go. Understand what motivates people and what is behind their behavior. Make you stronger. All right. Till next time, February 17th, we're going to be right here. We'll have another market segment report. Carlani, you were awesome today. I know it went a little bit long, but the information was amazing. We'll have another great topic for you. And we plan on having a guest speaker to talk about farming for carbon and carbon sequestration so that we can learn about, because that's a big thing moving, man, legislatively and um, societally. So that's what we're going to be talking about next time. We all good? Thanks for being here. Jim's going to be in touch with you, Carlena. Okay. Thanks, Carlena. Thanks a lot. Right, thank you.